that's a peachy. Okay, good. Okay, three, two, one. Hi, this is William Ramsey. Welcome to William Ramsey Investigates. On tonight's show, I have a very special guest, somebody who I'm delighted uh, has taken some time out of his day to talk about a book he wrote back in the day in May 1991 was its publication date. The title of the book is Angel of Darkness, The True Story of Randy Kraft and the Most Heinous Murder Spree. And the author is Dennis McDougall, who has published a number of other books as well that I uh, you know, I recently was doing some uh, research. He just published a book on Bob Dylan. Uh, the title of that book is Dylan, the Biography. That was in 2014. But uh, he's also written about Lou Rosserman. That title of that book is The Last Mogul. Uh, also, the story of Robert Blake and Bonnie Lee Blakely. That's Blood Cold. So he has uh, quite a few other books. But uh, like I said, tonight I'm just hoping to uh, talk to him about uh, this uh, Randy Kraft and uh, his book Angel of Darkness. So, Dennis McDougall, are you there? I am here. And awesome. do you prefer William or Bill? Whatever's easier. Doesn't matter. Bill's fine. Um, but uh, yeah, I've, I've kind of been researching the subject, kind of like what we were talking about in the, just in the pre show conversation. So, but you uh, not only researched this book, you had a unfortunate contact with. The killer himself. So maybe what we can do is, uh, for people who don't know of your background and all of the books, the many books that you've written, please talk a little bit about yourself and how you became interested in the subject of Randy Kraft. Well, I like to tell uh, people that I'm a recovering journalist. Um, a, uh, I, I was a re- newspaper reporter for uh, well, close to... 25 years, I guess, before I started writing books. And um, uh, the Randy Kraft book, which was my first, uh, grew out of uh, reporting that I did uh, in Long Beach um, and then later on at the Los Angeles Times um, that uh, you know surrounded this strange, not only Randy, Randy Kraft, but uh, a, a series, actually a trio of uh, serial killers who plied their craft um, in Southern California throughout the uh, 1970s and into the uh, mid-1980s. Uh, I got assigned the story shortly after Kraft was pulled over by a couple of high, uh, California highway patrolmen with a dead Marine in the seat next to him late one night on the uh, infamous 405 freeway. And um, uh, the story began to unravel, and um, my editors um, decided that uh, it needed follow-up. And the follow-up turned into uh, 10 years of uh, investigation and covering the... uh, a marathon trial in Orange County and um, uh, traveled to several different states where uh, where Kraft uh, uh, did his killings. Um, so uh, that's kind of how I got into it. It was an intriguing story, obviously. Uh, yep. And uh, I followed it for so long, I figured that uh, why not give it a shot as, as, as a, uh, a book subject. A book. And, I mean, when they first pulled him over in, I think, off the 405, like you said, did they know the enormity of his criminal activities? Oh, no. Was, uh, right. No, he, was just we- he, he was weaving down the highway in his uh, Toyota, uh, Toyota Celica at uh, 2 o'clock in the morning, and they thought they had just another, uh, you know, uh, another late-night drunk. And uh, they pulled him over and saw that he had uh, a passenger uh, in, in the seat next to him and um, uh, got him out of the car, did a uh, roadside sobriety test, concluded that he was legally uh, drunk. And then when they went to wake up the uh, passenger and say, you're going to have to find another way home because the 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 guy who's driving the car is uh, under arrest, uh, they discovered that he had his hands down to his knees and that uh, he'd been uh, ligatured um, 
and uh, garroted, uh, and that he was barely alive. So they took him to the nearest ER, and um, within the hour, he died. And that was the beginning. That was really how it started. And so it's it kind of unraveled that Kraft was much more active than just being around uh, Orange County in that area, correct? Well, yeah. I mean, you know, he started out, I suppose, the way that all serial killers do, um, or most of them anyway. Um, he, you know, it, it appears that he experimented when uh, he was in high school a little bit and advanced a bit more uh, when he was in college. Uh, got his girlfriend uh, loaded on uh, pharmaceutical um, laced beer and um, tried to see how long she would be out and uh, what he could get away with while she was uh, passed out. And, uh, you know, there were, at least to our knowledge, no, no deaths. Uh, at that point, he went into the Air Force, um, uh, admitted to being uh, homosexual, which back in those days was considered uh, grounds for um, expulsion. So he was uh, tossed out of the Air Force. And um, he, he had a propensity, um, even in the early days, for uh, Men in uniforms. So he liked that. Can you speak a little closer to the mic, please? Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Just it just sounds a little yeah, a bit muddled. A little fuzzy. Um, yeah. He, um, you know, he liked Marines, so he would uh, troll the uh, Marine bases in Southern California, of which are, there are several, and uh, pick up Marines and uh, offer them a beer and. Uh, uh, laced the beer beforehand with usually with Valium or uh, or something stronger, and uh, and then when they passed out, um, he had his way with them, uh, killed them, and tossed them by the side of the road. He did that for 13 years that we know of. Uh, you know, uh, the thing about Randy is that. Uh, even after all of these years and all of the mountains of evidence that have um, been presented against him and uh, conviction uh, on, I believe it was 12 or 14 of those murders, um, he maintains his innocence to this day and he's confessed to nothing. So we're going purely on guesswork. I mean, down to the present day, I got a call in my uh, three months ago from a fellow who's uh, doing a follow-up on the Golden State Killer uh, in California. And uh, he was telling me that that there may be some crossover in uh, that killer's um, victims and, and crass the confusion as to um, who these bodies, these unidentified bodies especially, belong to. Well, you know, I mean, it's, it's a, it's, it was supposedly came to an end 30 years ago, but, you know, these things never come to an end. And he's still alive. Kraft is still at uh, San Quentin waiting, I think, what, is he on his last appeal, or he's waiting to be put to death, correct? Well, yeah, but, you know, I mean... Well, they can uh, in California, the chances, right? The, the chances of his ever... Uh, you know, being put to death or slim or none. He's um, managed to duck it thus far, uh, and now Gavin Newsom is the governor, and uh, he's avowed uh, that he's going to see the death penalty um, put to death itself. I mean, right. there's no, there, there's uh, no popularity in terms of, of the death penalty uh, in California, so. Uh, Kraft's probably going to live out his final years on death row. Did you? Did they have a final tally count of how many people they think he murdered? 
No, the best that we have been able to come up with is the infamous scorecard. You know, he's, his nickname is the scorecard killer because he, uh, there was a coded list found in the trunk of his Celica. Um, and they, the investigators were able to match several of the names, um, I mean, close to 50 of the names, uh, or decoded names, to actual victims. Uh, but there are 60, 67 entries on that list. So the closest that uh, anyone has been able to come to in terms of um, figuring out his... Um, is Cali is uh, somewhat, I mean, and there's also a belief among uh, several of the investigators that he, he actually exceeded that uh, number by quite a few. Uh, I've heard, you know, the, the range is somewhere between 67 and 92. Wow. And he had kind of had the same MO. He was like a dry, they called him the, the, the scorecard killer, but also a freeway killer because he would just drive around and try to pick people up and then dump them off the freeway, right? Well, you see, that's what really made this, uh, made Angel of Darkness uh, a, a book length study, as far as I was concerned, because of that very. That, that very fact that uh, you just articulated there, uh, yes, he was just one of three that we know of uh, who were killing young men and leaving their bodies on the side of the road during the 1970s and early 80s in Southern California. And the, uh, the, the key um, uh, common trait of these three killers is that all three of them uh, – chose uh, males and more often than not uh, gay males as their victims so um, it, it becomes a, a period piece because in those days you know it seems like uh, ancient history like given the way that uh, we have evolved but in those days in the 1970s and into the 1980s um, at least as far as the mass media was concerned, and to some degree with law enforcement, there was no such thing as uh, gay killers. I mean, that, that's, uh, that was just um, uh, something that was sidestepped and, and not uh, with uh, very few exceptions in law enforcement, uh, no one paid much attention. Um, and there was even a uh, pejorative that uh, cops used back then. Uh, they referred to uh, gay victims as uh, misdemeanor murders. Uh, wow. There, there were uh, few resources, if any at all, put into um, uh, trying to get to the bottom of these killings. Uh, you know, they knew that they had a, uh, uh, an epidemic uh, in their, you know, in uh, along the freeway system in Southern California, but they uh, a did not acknowledge that uh, there were gay killers out there, uh, and b um, when they came across a uh, a young man, uh, especially a military man who might be gay and who uh, wound up dead on the side of the road. They just uh, shrugged it off and said, well, you know, they should have known better. Wow. And all those killings, too, were like in Southern California, those three killing the freeway killers that were just massive body counts, like incredible amount of people, super dangerous. And those were just the gay killers because there were also other serial killers act active. It seems like that era was a strange era. A lot of. Uh... Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I mean, this is all, it, it, it was all pre-DNA, so uh, you didn't have that tool uh, in your uh, kit box to try to tra track these people down. Um, the freeway system, uh, there weren't uh, anywhere near as many automobiles or drivers as, as there are now, so 
you know, you could kill somebody in uh, Costa Mesa and get in the car, drive for a, a, a half an hour, maybe uh, an hour, uh, dump the body, and no one would be the wiser. You know, and because the the body was so far removed from uh, the murder site, uh, and uh, jurisdictions were all always at cross purposes with each other. Right. Um, no one, uh, no one knew the difference. And uh, these guys, uh, among others, uh, literally, literally got away with murder for years. Do you think that Kraft was very aware or savvy to keep moving in between jurisdictions, like he knew what he was doing? I think he developed that. Uh, expert. I mean, I think uh, not at first, um, but I think that as time went on and he got um, more and more daring, you know, he graduated from doing uh, one murder at a time to uh, near the end, he was picking up two hitchhikers and doing them both in. Wow. Uh, he, he um, yeah, I think that he got, he got wise to it. He recognized uh how little law enforcement cared, uh, number one. And number two, um, he was a really smart guy, and he loved the, the game. I, in some respects, I think that Randy, Randy enjoyed playing the game of cops and robbers uh, more than, than he did uh, getting off uh, on the per perversity of... Uh, of having sex with a dead body. So he would kill them before he had sex with them? Is that, was that a common characteristic? No, not always. Not always. And in fact, there, are, there is some evidence that he would take, um, he would take a victim home and, uh, and keep him in an extra room, keep him uh, doped up and trussed up, and every time that uh, you know he would, the victim would come to, he would um, drug him up again and have his way with him during this you know period of time, where there's you know three or four or five days. Uh, and then when he got tired of the game, uh, he'd uh, he'd kill them and then get rid of the body. Wow! So he was definitely abducting and and. Like whatever, putting him in a dungeon. Did he have a dungeon, or did he just had him in a room on chained up, or what was? Do you, do you know any I, of those details? I I don't know that he had a dungeon. Uh, he um, it's likely that he used the garage, uh, which is, he had a detached garage, and um, his boyfriend, his last boyfriend. Uh, with whom he lived for I don't know, several years uh, before he was finally caught, um, was never indicted and convinced uh, the cops in their interrogation that uh, that he he had no idea that Randy was doing this, which is hard to believe. Um, but, you know, you have the uh, examples uh, of the BTK killer who, um, whose wife uh, had no idea that her husband was uh, the most prolific uh, serial killer in Kansas history. So uh, it's, it's possible that, um, that his boyfriend didn't know. Do you know, what, boyfriend, right. Do you know if, what, what the proportion of his victims were gay, or were they all gay, or was there 50-50, or do you know some were just random strangers? Do you know what the proportion was? Yeah, I mean, I don't know exactly what it is, but I do know that uh, more of his victims were heterosexual than they were gay. Interesting. Um, he he picked up, you know, he, he picked up hitchhikers, and um, back then, um, there was, uh, I, I don't know, it's completely, almost completely uh, ended now. I mean, people just don't hitchhike anymore. But back True. then, uh, you know, people 
uh, especially young men, um, would go out and hit the road and hitch everywhere. And uh, and Randy took full advantage of that. So the, the the other two. I mean, I should probably point out that the the other two who were uh, applying their trade at the same time as Randy uh, were uh, a, a guy named Patrick Kearney, whose nickname was the Trash Bag Killer, uh, and then uh, who may still be alive too. I'm not sure. Uh, last I checked, he was. Uh, he'd be. In his 80s now, I guess. Anyway, um, there was Kearney, and then the uh, the third member of the trio was uh, uh, William Bonham, uh, who uh, uh, was also known. Or he was known, you know, as the freeway killer, and he had like I don't know three or four um, weak brain minions who uh, went out and worked with him as. Uh, as his sidekicks, and um, and Bonham, um of the three, he's the only one who's been executed. Interesting. And I mean, there was some speculation that Kraft was not alone in some of the murders. Is that correct? Yeah, it's almost uh, for certain that his first um, live-in boyfriend, who passed away from uh, AIDS before uh, Randy was arrested, um, that uh, he was his accomplice. Because there were several instances where the cops found two sets of footprints and uh, uh, bodies were so heavy that they uh, had to have been uh, handled by uh, more than one person. So... Um, the supposition is that his uh, first boyfriend was uh, his accomplice. And who knows, he may have had other accomplices. But, you know, I interviewed several people who knew him well, who played uh, bridge with him uh, every week and went on vacations with him and uh, parties and went out slumming and so on and so forth. And none of them, none of them had... Uh, the vaguest idea. They were as shocked as wow. anyone else. And that, that was the same with his family, too. Like, certain of his family members didn't believe that he was a serial killer either, right? Oh, right. And in fact, his uh, older sister, uh, uh, she was a retired school teacher, I guess, by the time that Randy was uh, busted. But she... Uh, She's been, or she was, I don't know if she's still with us or not, but she was his uh, standard bearer for years and set up his website and uh, maintained that he was uh, innocent and that this was all trumped up by the authorities. Um, so, yes, uh, at least uh, one of his three sisters, and possibly two, um that he was uh, that he was innocent, and he uh, he worked. Did he work on military bases, or did he live when when he got busted? Was he living in Long Beach? Yeah, he was living in Long Beach. He had a he, he and his uh, uh, boyfriend uh, Jeff Seelig was his name, uh, a chocolatier. Uh, I guess that's a. A career path. At any rate, he, uh, uh, Jeff Seelig and Randy went in together and uh, purchased uh, uh, an old craftsman home uh, on one of the side streets in Long Beach and uh, spent the last, I don't know, two or three years, I guess, before uh, Randy was arrested, uh, upgrading their home. And uh, Randy was. Uh, into gardening, and they, they had a uh, um, they had a, a fluffy sheepdog as a pet, and they just appeared to be as domestic as uh, as wow. you can imagine. That's incredible. Do you know if Randy Woodcraft was like a guy who went to gay bars? Like, did he frequent gay bars to get victims, or it was all driving? Because I thought there was one. Like his first victim was a bartender at a gay bar, right? Yeah, uh, Randy did 
he did uh, cruise Javars, um, but you know, you were asking a, a bit earlier uh, whether he, there was uh, any method in his uh, game playing with cops. I think that uh, I, I think that's this is the case in point. Early on, he did go to gay bars and he did pick up uh, uh, some of his early victims at gay bars. But then, you know, at some point he had an epiphany and uh, realized that, uh, you know, even the densest cop is going to say, hmm, gay victim, gay bar, um, Maybe we should look for a gay killer at these gay bars. Oh, right, right. And, um, and you know, he began to branch out uh, in part because he liked military victims, as I uh, said earlier, but also because I, I think at some level, uh, maybe it was just instinctive or maybe it was thought out, but at some level, Randy recognized that. Uh, um, you better pick your victims um, in such a way that uh, no one's going to connect you to them. Right, right. I mean, it's just amazing that he could have killed over 100 people. And it also was multi-state. There were supposedly, like, some deaths all around, what, Michigan and Oregon. Is that correct? Yes. Well, you know, and, there, you know, there's even some speculation that uh, uh, he may have had victims uh, in as far away as Key West and oh, wow. um, Washington State, uh, and possibly even uh, in Europe uh, at one point, because you see what Randy did. Randy, Randy was an early uh, computer whiz. Um, had he not been caught, and had he, you know, uh, chosen a, a different hobby. Um, he might well be, uh, you know, a, a millionaire in Silicon Valley today because uh, that was where he was headed in terms of uh, his expertise. And, uh, and he was a consultant and very much in demand. So uh, computer companies and, um, and others who had need of uh, his services uh, flew him all over the place. And uh, you know, he he wound up doing two for one at uh, a Grand Rapids um, hotel during a uh, computer convention in Michigan. Left them left their dead bodies in the snow and uh, and flew back home and leaving no trace. Wow, that's terrifying. Uh, and he did hmm. several times in Oregon. He was, uh, he had, it did a lot of consulting work up in Portland, and um, uh, for recreation, he'd rent a car on the weekend, go out, pick somebody up, uh, rape them, kill them, toss their body on the side of the road, get uh, rid of the rental car, and uh, fly back home. And he had, a, he had a college degree. I mean, he was intelligent. Did they ever give him an IQ test? I don't know. Oh, sorry, I, curiosity. I don't, I mean... Perhaps, um, yeah. I mean, he, he graduated. Uh, he had, had a bachelor's. Uh, I believe it, it was in economics. At any rate, he, he took his bachelor's degree from um, uh, one of the Claremont colleges, which is you know it's no small potatoes. Right. Claremont's a difficult uh, college to get into. Uh, he was bright. He was uh, inquisitive. He was, uh, you know, he had, uh, in many respects, he had everything going for him except for the fact that he was gay. Uh, and after he was bounced out of the military, um, uh, you know, he had to find his find a a way. Um, find a career right. and he stumbled into computers and you have a, a unfortunate uh, connection with him because he didn't like something you said about him correct <laughs> or wrote about him oh yeah right. yeah 
There's yeah. that. Yes. Well, Randy, you know, I mean, I, I, I covered the. I covered the the case. I covered his arrest. I covered his uh, uh, arraignment, uh, his pre-trial, all of the hearings that led up to his trial, and then I covered covered his trial to boot, um, which was the only time that I had any any face-to-face time with him. You know, I couldn't uh, couldn't talk to him, but I sat right in front of him, and he knew who I was. Um, but, um, but, you know, I, I started writing letters to him and he responded, um, uh, shortly after he had been, uh, convicted and, um, we corresponded for a few months and, you know, he was playing cagey games. He wasn't going to talk and, uh, he was innocent and, uh, I was prejudici- prejudicial, uh, as were uh, everybody else in, in uh, the press, and uh, and you know uh, it, it was. And he played, the, you know, he played the, these games. He continued to do so with other people later on, but that was my my first um, dealings with him. So ultimately. Uh, I landed the book contract, I wrote the book, um, and it was published and uh, was doing relatively well when one day somebody knocked on my front door and handed me a, uh, um, a paper and said, you've been served. And I looked at it and uh, lo and behold, Randy Kraft uh, was suing me for a libel um from death row um he uh maintained in his uh lawsuit that i had besmirched his good name and not if but when he got out of uh of jail that he would no longer be able to work because of all of the damage that i had done to him and thus he was asking me to uh, asking the uh, court to award him sixty million dollars. So, right. After after he was convicted for killing what eighteen people or something or twenty people, that's what he thinks. Yeah. Yep. Yes. So anyway, um, I had to hire a lawyer and uh, go to court and uh, and you know we presented our side of it to the judge and I I timed it you know, I I had a wrist, wrist watch back then and I I, I watch I, I looked at the watch and it took the judge uh, judge Torres I think was his name if I'm not mistaken anyway it took him exactly 42 seconds to throw it out of the court wow well, that's good. That's quick. The first, first and last time I have ever been sued uh, in my entire career, uh, and you know, that's good um, to know. That's been it's been twenty years since then, twenty five years, right? Yeah. And there's moving on to other subjects. That was the Angel of Darkness, but you've written like what some other true crime books, but also fascinating book dylan there was one about lou wasserman who's the father of debbie wasserman schultz who's in the news all the time how did you get involved or interested in lou wasserman no no debbie wasserman schultz is not uh, lou's daughter (gasps) okay i apologize i was misinformed i thought that was the case that 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 would be a a uh um an easy mistake to make. Okay, but, my apologies. Uh, no, his, his daughter's name was Lynn Wasserman. And, okay. Um, and still is, to my knowledge. Anyway, she's uh, up in years now. And she she is the mother, however, of, um, of Casey Wasserman. And Casey Wasserman uh, is, I believe he is currently the uh, the head of or the CEO of uh, the Los Angeles 
Olympic Organizing Committee. Oh, fascinating. Uh, he's the, the kingpin who's going to be bringing the uh, Olympics to uh, Los Angeles. I think it's from... already here. 2028, I think, is the Olympics, right? Yeah, that's my, it. My memory is so correct. He, he's, the, he, he's the chief executive of that uh, little project. How did anyway, you... Lou Watson. Yeah. Sorry. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, please continue. I was just going to ask you to tell me about Lou Wasserman. Well, uh, Lou Wasserman was uh, a, a talent agent who headed up a, a, a company called uh, MCA, which stood for Music Corporation of America. Uh, and they bought Universal Studios in the 1960s. And Wasserman subsequently became the most powerful man in Hollywood for uh, close to half a century. Um, uh, it's interesting that you should single that out because I just uh, made a deal with Stars Television. They're going to turn it into a, um, a series oh, great. Uh, probably with, within the next year. Congrats. We just got finished writing, writing the pilot. Awesome. Um, yeah, so uh, Wasserman was um, uh, an interesting character because uh, not only was he a talent agent uh, who, who, you know, made and broke stars at will, he was also uh, tied in uh, to both the Chicago and the Cleveland uh, mob um, and was sort of the nexus of, um, of the mafia and... Um, and the entertainment business uh, in the second half of the 20th century. Uh, so it's a fascinating story, uh, a story of, um, you know, a, a, a kid from the slums of Cleveland um, marrying the right girl, rising to the top, and then um, and near the end of his life, uh, crashing and losing everything. So, uh, interesting. Uh, a classic American story. Well, I have to read that. I would love to read that. I actually remember when that got published. I was like, oh, this looks like an interesting book, but I didn't know you as an author at that time. And you also have written about Bob Dylan, Jack uh, Nicholson. Um, what was your most recent public book? Bush, I, book. I thought it was the Dylan book. Is that correct? Uh, well, I wrote a couple of novels. Okay. Um, more for myself than uh, and anything else, uh, and I'm I'm wrapping up a book right now for uh, Skyhorse uh, Publications um, uh, about the um, the world's um, um, biggest LSD manufacturer. Oh, um, was that the a, uh, uh, Eternal Sun Group of Eternal Sunshine or whatever? It was down in Orange County. Well, this guy has, uh, the, the fellow I'm writing about, whose name is Leonard Picard, oh, uh, was a chemist for the Brotherhood, okay. among others. And uh, he was, he and his uh, partner were busted in an abandoned uh, uh, Atlas missile silo in, uh, in the middle of Kansas. Um, by the DEA, um, was tried and sentenced to two life sentences uh, for manufacturing LSD. What year was this? And, uh, it was on election eve of the year 2000. So, so it's fairly recent. Yeah. Is he still in jail? And, uh, oh, yeah. He's still... He's, I mean, you know, two life sentences, two life sentences. Right. So yes, he's still uh, he's seventy four years old, and uh, I visit him from time to time in uh, the uh, federal prison in Tucson, Arizona. Gotcha. And do you have a working title for that book that you're allowed to share? Operation White Rabbit. Operation White Rabbit. How did you get that name? Well, that's what the DEA called uh, their sting operation when they took him down. Operation White Rabbit. And when does that expect? To, when do you expect to have that published? 
Uh, I think it's on the um, the the list for early next year, so it will probably be in uh, January or February of 2020. Oh, great. Well, I look forward to that. Operation White Rabbit, and uh, the book we talked about is titled Angel of Darkness, the true story of Randy Kraft and the most heinous murder spree of the century. Is there anything else you, you'd like to share, or anything we didn't cover, or anything you'd like to add on? Oh, well, I... I, I mean, I could go on forever okay. if you want. <laughs> well, we could do another show. I would love to sit down and just pick your brain over Lou Wasserman. I would like to read the book first, though. But uh, um, well, be my guest. I, I'm okay. more than welcome, more than happy to do so. Awesome. I mean, you know, if if you're if you're interested, uh, Bill, I, you know, I, I would urge you to uh, to Google. Uh, Picard's name, William yeah. Leonard Picard is William. his name, and uh, and I guarantee you, you will be fascinated. This cool. guy's left phrase is incredible. I'll take a look at that. Again, one last time, Dennis McDougall, title of the book is Angel of Darkness. Thank you very much. You're quite welcome. Awesome. It's been a pleasure. Likewise. Okay, I just stopped.